of Mrs. Prayer. She died recently at the first neglected church of Ho-Hum Avenue. Born many years ago in the midst of great revival, Mrs. Prayer was strong and healthy. She fed largely on Bible study and grew into worldwide fame as one of the most important members of the church family. However, in recent years, Mrs. Prayer has been failing in health, rendered helpless by the stiffening of the neck, the cooling of the heart, and a lack of concern for those things spiritual. Experts, including Dr. Good Works, Dr. Socializing, and Dr. Who Cares, disagree as the cause to her fatal illness. They all administered large doses of excuses and even ordered last minute motivational bypass just before she passed. A post-mortem examination showed that a shortage of regular spiritual food, an absence of love for her maker, and a disregard for Christian service all contributed to the ultimate demise of prayer. Do we want a vibrant, active, energetic prayer life? You know, as I speak to you tonight, I know I'm talking to those who have made prayer a staple of their daily life. And so, as I share this portion of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, I, I feel like, you know, I'm sharing, sharing it with the choir that is already praying a lot. So, what I'm hoping for tonight is that you'll be more impassioned for prayer and that perhaps you'll be able to share with other less inclined believers uh, to the importance of prayer. I mean, do we even want to know that God works through prayer? Do we understand what is at stake when we pray? Do we understand what is available to us when we lift our voices before the Creator God Almighty? I fear many people don't. And so tonight, I want to take a look at what it takes to get an answer to our prayers. In a continuation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, he says clearly in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, say everyone, everyone, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Tonight, we're knocking on heaven's door, and we're going to find out, I pray, how we get our answer. Jesus says that there's two basic parts. There's man's part. And there's God's part. When we look at man's part there in verse 7, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So first, in order to get an answer to our prayers, the first thing we must do is we got to ask. That means we have to spend time in prayer. We actually have to go through the labor, if you will, in spending time with our God spending time with our Father in heaven, you must ask. In the New Living Translation, James paraphrases chapter 4, verse 2 very well. James wrote, you want what you don't have, and so you scheme and kill to get it. 
You're jealous for what other people have. You can't possess it. And so you fight and quarrel to take it away from them. Yet the reason you don't have. The reason you don't have what you want is because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You only want what gives you pleasure. Wow. So we have to be careful with this asking. We have to be careful with what we ask, but also how we ask. It's clear to me that we must ask believing. Ask without doubting. The day after the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus was on his way back out of the city, and he was hungry. And he looked off in the distance, and he noticed there was a fig tree over there, and it was full of leaves, and so he walked over to the fig tree to see if there were any figs on the tree. He gets over to the tree, and there was not one single fig on that whole tree. And so he said to that tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Now, was Jesus being mean to that tree? No, there was a lesson coming about that fig tree. A couple mornings after, Jesus and the disciples passed the same way, and they passed the same fig tree, and it was dried up. From the roots. Remembering what Jesus said, Peter, kind of uh, in a startled, unbelieving tone, said, Teacher, look! That fig tree that you cursed is completely withered. And then Jesus said, Have faith in God. You see who he was relating himself to? Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to, says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt but believes, believes what he says will happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. Now, we cannot take that that one scripture and conform all of our theology about prayer around that one verse. Because what do we do? We take the entire Bible and develop our theology around that. But certainly one thing that we learn from that is, is that you must ask believing. Now, when I read that passage, I wonder, is that a testament to how I feel about prayer in my life? Because judging from the sheer number of challenges in my life, judging from the sheer, sheer size of my mountains in my life, I wonder sometimes, how much faith do I really have in God? When I examine my challenges in my mountains, I wonder how much doubt still exists in my heart. Apparently, there are times in my life when I don't really believe that God can do what I ask him to do. How often do I not receive because I'm either afraid or I'm faithless to ask him for what I want? Friends, we must ask believing just as we Ask believing to come into the family of God. That's exactly how we come into the family of God. We ask God for his grace and his mercy. And we place our faith in Christ. John said it in chapter 1 verse 12. He said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So just like we come into the family of God, when we want an answer to prayer, we've got to ask believing. But it's not just about asking and believing. There's more. Because you also must ask in the name of Jesus. As Jesus was comforting and encouraging his disciples before his arrest, he instructed them on two occasions to ask in prayer in his name. In John 15, 
Here's one of them. In John 15, verse 15, he said, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit shall remain. Here we go. That whatever you may ask the Father in my name, he may give you. In the very next chapter, in John 16, and verse 23, he said, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. So what does this mean, praying in the name of Jesus? Does it mean that I just got to put a tagline on the end of my prayer? In Jesus' name, amen, and I'm good to go? We know better. John, 1 John 5, 14 clarifies what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. In 1 John 5, 14, the scriptures say, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, here we go, according to his will, y'all get that? That's praying in Jesus' name. According to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So it's not about Jesus getting right. It's not about God getting right. It's not about God changing his mind. It's about me getting right. It's about me aligning my will with his will, not him aligning his will with mine. As James says, sometimes we pray amiss. Why? Because we want to spend it on our own pleasures or on what makes us happy or what pleases us. We want what we want, not necessarily what God wants. So we must ask believing and we certainly must ask in Jesus' name according to his will. I ran across this wedding prayer that illustrates just how cleverly we do this. This girl is uh, praying to the Father in heaven on her wedding day. And here's what she says. Dear God, I can hardly believe that this is my wedding day. I know that I haven't been able to spend much time with you lately. And with the rush of the wedding and all the preparations, it's been difficult. And I just want to tell you, Father, I'm sorry. I guess, too, I feel a little bit guilty because when I try to pray all about this, I realize that my fiancé, Larry, is still not a Christian. But, oh, Father, I love him so much. What else am I to do? I can't just give him up. Oh, couldn't you just save him somehow, some way? You know how much I've prayed for him. You know the way that he and I have discussed the gospel together. I've tried not to appear too religious so I don't run him off. You know he's not hostile toward you. You know that he, he just hasn't responded yet. Oh, if only you would make him a Christian. Dear Father, please bless our marriage. I don't want to disobey you, but I do love him. And I do want to be his wife. So please be with us. And don't let my wedding day be spoiled. You know, that prayer sounds so sincere, doesn't it? It sounds so earnest, does it not? But when you strip away all that fine, pious language, let me tell you what you really got. God, I don't want to disobey you. But I got to have my way at all costs. I love what you do not love, and I want what you do not want. So please be a good God. Deny yourself, move off your throne, and let me take this. Let me take it over. 
if you don't like this, all I ask is that you bite your tongue, God, and that you say or do nothing that might spoil my plans. Just let me enjoy my day. If you're going to ask believing in the name of Jesus, you better be prepared to obey in the name of Jesus. Amen? And don't think for a second that God doesn't know if you're ready to do that. If you're going to ask in the name of Jesus, you better be prepared to obey in the name of Jesus. So if you're going to ask and get an answer from God, you must ask. Second, to get an answer, you must also seek. Seek what? How about seeking the glory of God in your requests? John 14, 13, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, he's doing it right, right? That I will do so that my Father will be glorified in the Son. So is what you're praying going to glorify God? If you're praying for something for yourself, and it will not ultimately bring glory to God. You can hang it up. It ain't happening. If you are praying something for something for someone else. And it will not ultimately glorify God. You are out of luck. It ain't happening. The very reason that we exist. According to Isaiah 43. Is to bring glory to God in everything we do. Does it make any sense to you that God would grant a request that goes completely contrary to the reason we exist? Which is to glorify Him. It doesn't make any sense. To get an answer, you must seek. Seek the glory of God. Otherwise, your answer is probably going to be, not yet. Amen? But not only seek God's glory, we must also seek to be obedient. And again, God knows. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, John writes, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask we receive from Him, because, here we go, because we keep His commandments and do the things pleasing in His sight. Obedience is pretty important to God. Would you agree? Seek to be obedient. Now, it's not just the obedience on the outside that matters. It's obedience on the inside that matters. There are a whole lot of reasons that people obey. Would you agree with that? Some people obey because they're fearful. Some people obey because they want a reward. Some people obey because they love. So, do you obey because you have to? Do you obey because you think you're going to get something out of it? Or do you obey the Lord because you love Christ and love people? God knows the why behind our obedience. I can tell you this. God knows the motives behind our obedience. If we obey with bad intentions, your request is going no higher than this ceiling right here. He knows our motives. So to get an answer, you must seek to be obedient, but with the right motives. If you're living a disobedient lifestyle, God's answer to your prayer will likely be, not yet. But not only should we seek God's glory, not only should we seek to be obedient, we should also seek what the will of God is. Seek God's will. John 9, 31. We know, the Bible says, We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing, he is a worshiper of God, and does his will, he hears us. Pretty important. I remember hearing a story about a fifth grade boy who heard a sermon on being persistent in prayer. So he goes home and he's praying in his room and his dad overhears him through the crack in the door and the boy is saying over and over again, Tokyo, 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 Tokyo. 
Finally, the father busts in and, and says, son, what are you doing? He said, well, I gave the wrong, a wrong answer on my test, and I'm praying that God would make Tokyo the capital of Mexico. <laughs> He's saying, I'm praying God would make my mistake right. It's kind of like what that girl who was getting married was doing. She wanted her will, and she wanted God to bless her mistake. How often do we do the same thing? How often do we want God to adjust to what we want? Rather than seeking God's will, taking the time, taking the diligence to seek what the will of the Lord is, and adjust to him. Make the changes in us that would conform to his will rather than going our way and our will. Hey man, to get an answer, I'm just telling you, you got to seek God's will, not your own. You must ask and you must seek. But third, we had Jesus also said, to get an answer, you must knock. Fisherman, been out of fellowship with the Lord for years, was at sea with his godless companions. All of a sudden, a storm rolls up, threatens to sink their ship. His friends begin begging the man, begging him to pray and ask God to spare them. But he objected. He said, oh, man, it has been such a long time since I prayed. Well, I haven't even stepped foot in a church for years. But they insisted, and finally, he cries out to God, and he says, Oh, Lord, I haven't asked anything from you in 15 years. And if you'll just help us now, if you'll just bring us safely to land, I promise you, I won't bother you again for another 15. <laughs> hmm. We smile about that. But that is a sobering reminder that prayer is often used as an escape mechanism rather than a way of life. And it happens even amongst the fervent believers. The man standing before you is guilty of such things. I've done the same. I called on God when I reached the end of my rope, when I've had all I can stand. And I cry out to God and ask him to help me. When there's no other way, I get on my knees and I cry out to God when I should have been on my knees all along during the matter. Escape mechanism. Yeah, it's true of us. It's true of believers sometimes. In fact, I, I, I see this in Luke chapter 18, why don't you go there with me? Luke chapter 18, and let's read what uh, Jesus had to say about this issue of persistent prayer. You've heard this story before. In Luke chapter 18, and verse 1, Jesus is speaking a parable. And in verse 1 of Luke chapter 18, he, he speaks this parable to his disciples that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. No matter what. Pray and don't lose heart. And he said, there was in this certain city a judge who didn't fear God nor regard man. And there was this widow in the same city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God or regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. And then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And this is the important part. And shall God not avenge his own elect? I mean, whose God is your God anyway? Shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith? On earth? Will he really find faith 
on earth. In that passage, in Luke chapter 18, we find that sometimes knocking requires a lot of faith. Because if it doesn't come immediately, then I can drift. Sometimes I have to find that, that my praying must have much courage. Because if the problem keeps coming at me, then it begins to weigh on me. And the burden gets too heavy. Sometimes my knocking just must be persistent. I must keep on praying and knocking until the answer comes. So to get an answer to our prayers, man's part is to ask believing and in the name of Jesus to seek God's glory, that is seek to obey God's word, his glory and his will, and to not persistently listen as a way of life, night and day, all the time. Ask, seek, and knock. That's man's part. Now let's take a quick look at God's part. What is God's part? God's part is to answer prayer. Did you know that? I said answer prayer, not answer your prayer. Amen? Amen. His job is to answer prayer. Now, there are two facts that we got to know about God's part of prayer. Number one, God hears and answers every prayer. Do you know that? Verse 8, for everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds to him who knocks, it will be open. Now, there are two certainties when we pray. One is God hears every prayer. The other certainty is God always answers. He always, always answers. The verse says, everyone who asks receives. Did I read that right? Everyone who asks receives. It says everyone receives. But it's a mistake to think that the only possible answer is yes. That's the problem. There are other possibilities. No may be a very valid answer. Not yet may be a very valid answer. But God does hear. And God does answer every prayer. Now there's a second fact that we need to know about God's part in prayer. And that is, sometimes God gives us what we need, not what we ask for. Let's look at verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things, not bad things, give good things to those who ask him? See, even earthly dads, Give their kids good stuff. We don't give a child a red hot chili pepper, do we? Unless you got it twisted, right? <laughs> My stepfather was kind of twisted. He had an unusual sense of humor. Uh, that's a testimony. I remember eating a red hot chili pepper when I was very young. But my dad wasn't as bad as John Hamby's de dad. John Hamby's dad once had him hold on to the spark plug of the lawnmower while he cranked it up to see if it was firing. Guess what? It was firing. It was firing him right out, knocked the fire right out of him. But generally speaking, we don't give things to our children that we know will truly harm them. And if it's just true of earthly fathers, how much more, how much more true must it be of our heavenly father who loves us and adores us? One day a young man came to the foreman of a logging crew asking for a job. And the foreman said, well, that depends. Let's see you cut down this tree. The young man stepped forward and he skillfully cut down that huge tree, impressed the foreman, said, you starting on Monday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday rolled by. And on Thursday afternoon, the foreman approached that young man and said, 
you can pick up, on, pick up your paycheck on the way out today. Startled, the young man said, well, I thought we'd get paid on Friday. He said, normally you do, but you're fired. You've fallen behind. You dropped from first place on Monday to last place on Wednesday. And the boy got all tore up. He said, I don't understand it. I'm a hard worker. I arrive first. I stay late. I work through my breaks. And sensing the boy's integrity, the foreman thought for a minute, and he said, boy, have you been sharpening your axe? And the young man replied, well, I've been working too hard to do that. How about you? How about you? Have you been too busy? Have you been too hard at work to sharpen your axe? Well, Bill, how do I do that? Just what we've been talking about tonight. Prayer. Prayer is what gives your Christian life that sharp edge. And if you don't do it, I want to give you a promise tonight. You will be dull. Without prayer, the more work you do, the duller and slower and weaker you'll get. I pray that you'll not only take these issues of prayer, man's part and God's part, that you'll not only apply them to your own life, but you'll, you'll share them. Because there's a lot of immature believers out there that don't get why they're not getting what they want from their prayers. And they need to understand what Jesus said in this passage. That you have to ask, and you have to ask believing, asking in the name of Jesus according to his will, not your will. That you've got to seek the glory of God in your prayer. That you've got to seek to be obedient, seeking to be and align your will with God's will. And you got to knock, and you got to keep on knocking. Because we don't understand God's timing. We don't understand how long it's going to take God to work out all the different things that he wants to work out in order to answer the prayer appropriately. So we have to keep on knocking by faith, with courage, and persistence. And when we do that, you can be assured that God hears you, that God's going to answer you. It may not be the answer you want right now, but he's going to answer you. And it may not be what you ask for, but it will be what you need. Sharpen your axe. Continue to sharpen your axe daily. If you don't, you'll be walking around dull. That's my promise to you tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of divine communication with our creator. Lord, I thank you that, that you want to hear from your children. And Lord, it's my prayer tonight that you be glorified by how we pray. That we come to you in all humility, asking for what we do not have. Believing and Asking according to the perfect will of the Lord our God. Seeking your glory, Lord. Seeking after you. Seeking, knowing that what we ask for, we're going to be obedient to your commands. Lord, seeking to align our will with your will. And Lord, we're just going to keep on knocking. Because we know that you hear. And Lord, we know that you'll answer. Lord, we're going to keep on knocking because we know that you're going to give us what we need, not necessarily what we ask for. Lord, thank you for simple passages of Scripture that open our eyes to the reality of the Christian life, especially in this issue of prayer. Lord, I pray that we continue to sharpen our acts, that we continue to be sharp, sharpen our Christian life, and that, Lord, you'll do a remarkable work in us as we seek to glorify you. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for your son Jesus tonight. And we ask you, Lord, to do a mighty work in this church and the members individually for your glory. All in the high and holy name of your son Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Be blessed.